Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. I've entitled this Mankind's Need of Christ's Appearance. Not that I'm trying to make an absolute distinction between Christ and God. I do believe that Christ is truly man, he's truly God. But my focus on that point last week was to trace the fact that while mankind was removed from God's present, presence after the fall, and indeed unable to come to God, God mercifully appeared. He came to man. And we followed Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, and we saw how God appeared to Abraham and then to Moses. And then finally, we saw just briefly that God did appear in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he appeared without fault. He is the perfect representation of God, Hebrews chapter 1 says. God's appearance is necessary then for mankind's salvation. And this is really the point of these sermons on epiphany. Epiphany, remembers, just means appearance, manifestation. Christ appeared. He was manifested. We see that all throughout the, Old, or the New Testament. And I want us to consider these things when we come to this Advent season for our worship of God to be centered on this truth. Our concern today has to do with more the details. Why Christ came. You know, we often describe that in the summary statement, the, the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is a truthful and trustworthy saying, the Apostle Paul says. He came to save sinners. Jesus, it is said of him in the gospel that he came to save his people from their sin. We cannot celebrate Christmas rightly if we bypass the problem of sin. And I don't mean just the problem of alienation before God's presence. I mean more than that because the scripture means more than that. Alienation from God means condemnation. It also signifies that we have an enemy. We have an enemy that's called the devil, called Satan. It also means that we have a problem with doing righteousness conducting ourselves righteously in this world. And it also has the problem of this whole world, the earth, the creation of God being under a curse because of our sin. So this is the detail that I want to get into a bit this morning. And the first point I have then is that Jesus appeared to take away sin's condemnation. Sin's condemnation. There are many texts that we could go to in this point. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul is quoting a psalm there. This is a truth that we see from the beginning to the end of Scripture. Is mankind is fallen and we've all sinned and we have come short of the glory of God, which is to say we have not done His will. We have failed of our Creator. And that comes with the consequence. The wages of sin is death. The scriptures clearly point that these are problems for man, all mankind, Jew and Gentile. No birthright gives you a way out of this. No natural progeny will lead you to salvation. These wages belong to all mankind, and they do for two reasons. First, in Adam, the Bible says all sin in Adam, because all face the same death. Even though we didn't sin like Adam, we all are... His sin is counted to the whole human race under him. Indeed, we inherit a sinful nation, nature because of him. Second, the problem comes to all because all are sinful. All commit sin who live in this world. 
And our first problem because of this condition of sin is not that the devil controls us or uh, that we just do wrong day to day and so we'll be uh, okay if we do right tomorrow. It's not an imbalance of right versus wrong. Those aren't right ways to think about this problem. It doesn't even have to do with the difficulty that we all experience under the sun. Man is born for adversity as sparks fly upward and that is the root cause of that is sin but that is not our great and great our greatest concern it shouldn't be if it is i hope you'll hear this the scriptures say that our great concern is that the wrath of god remains on us you see god is a just god one of the ways that we understand that we are created in god's image is that we relate in a world where wrongdoing requires justice and we know that deep within our souls we know that even people that can have completely and polar opposite views of morality still want their what their view of good is to be upheld by justice and this is what we see in god himself god is a just god the reason we see that there is a wage for sin is because God will justly judge sinners. That's a point that I made this week when I preached on Sodom and Gomorrah. That is not a text that teaches us that God may do that to this nation if we don't repent. That is not the purpose for that text. The purpose for that text in Jude says that that judgment of brimstone and fire from heaven is a picture of eternal wrath. And this is the wage of sin. Death is not merely separation from God. A lot of times common, it's common for pastors to say that because we don't like to speak about hell. I don't think it's probably good if a pastor is absolutely comfortable speaking about hell. It is one of the most horrific but true things that hell is spoken of in scripture and is a not merely a place but it is a state of being wherein those who have sinned against God if there is no answer for their sin will face the judgment and the wrath of God for eternity it takes my breath away to say it it's something that every one of us should face with a sort of tremulous tone, a sense of concern. The wrath of God. But if it is not for this truth that God is just and will judge rightly the sinners who reject him, then the truth of Christ's coming will not hit us so deeply. And the worship that we have towards him will not be as great as it ought to be. We celebrate Christ's appearing for this reason, first of all, that he came to release us from the condemnation of God. So that the judgment of God, the wrath of God would not be upon us any longer that we would be condemned no longer under the just penalty of almighty god this does not happen just because god says so god does not judge the sinner just because he decides oh i'm not gonna hold you accountable anymore because i decided not to God's righteousness in himself means that he holds himself to that standard. You can't separate his standard of righteousness from himself. He has to hold sin accountable. And how does he do that? He does that by the appearing of Christ, the scriptures say. Romans 3.21 says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. These words manifested, appeared. This is part of this idea of Christ's appearing that we need to keep in mind. 
The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness, and this is how he's defining the righteousness that is being manifested, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. In other words, that's a reality for sinners now that we can have the righteousness of God by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been made manifest since he has come. Why does faith in Jesus Christ make sinners righteous in God's sight? I hope our church can answer this. But it come in the preceding, in the following verses. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Jew and Gentile alike, everybody. But listen to this. And are justified by his grace as a gift. Through, this is how it happens, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That is, Christ became himself the means of mercy for sinners when he died, when he shed his blood on Calvary. This is a manifestation of God's righteousness. And how does it, how is it counted to our account? To, all, to be ours? to be received by faith. Because Christ died in our place, redeeming us from the penalty of our sin, God justly can declare us righteous when we trust in Christ. This is what these verses are saying. This means that even though we continue to wage war against sin, as what Paul says, I still have this war waging in my body. He can also at the same time say, Romans 8, 1 through 3, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of death and sin. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. You don't often think of Romans as a Christmas epistle, do you? But it is. It's all about Christ coming in fulfillment of the promises of God. And the good news of God is that he came and that he died as a substitute for sinners. And that sinners, although incapable of coming, of coming to God and rectifying their own problem of unrighteousness in themselves, but by merely believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that faith in Christ, boasting only in him, says that God will count his righteousness ours because he counted our sins upon him. And so there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was manifested when Christ appeared for us. Another way that Paul says that is, therefore we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're singing about. What do you mean? peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Do you see a lot of goodwill towards men in this world? There's a little bit. God has not left us without his presence. His people ought to have it. We ought to have it towards each other. We have it very little in our political realm, very little in our popular realm, very little in our governmental realm as it reacts with global powers around the world. Sometimes we don't even have it in our home. But the gospel means that you have good news. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ today this afternoon, tonight when you're struggling with doubts and temptations and you sin this next week, you can face God trusting him that even that sin repented of truly has an answer because Christ died to remove that from the face of God as far as the east is from the west. And there's no condemnation. 
any longer. We might as well just get used to that sound. We heard it the whole time Brother Jimmy was reading. And we're gonna hear it for a little right now. Huh? We can, we can just have us, let's just take a little time while that noise is going on to remember we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you go about this season with that underneath you? Because if you don't, I don't know how you have peace. We make so much of this Advent season as a culture to divert our attention from peace with God. We do it as much as we can. And we do. And Christ is sufficient to grant us that peace. But before we move on, because that's sufficient to say what I want to say on that point, it's all throughout the New Testament. I want us to see how the author of Hebrews describes this same good news. Hebrews 9, 26, at the end of verse 26, says this, but as it is, he appeared, that is Jesus in his high priestly office, appeared once for all at the end of the ages, and this is how he describes it, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That putting away does not mean, he, he just set it aside for a time. It means what the scriptures say when they say that our transgressions are removed from God's face as far as the east is from the west. There is no more remembrance of our sin by the holy God. That is, he will not bring a charge against us at all. He will not allow Satan to bring a charge. There is no condemnation means now, not just future, but now the Holy One, God, counts us righteous because of Jesus Christ. He's appeared for this purpose. Christ appeared for this purpose and he accomplished this and we ought to praise his holy name. Second, Jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil. From the beginning of creation, we've had an enemy. His temptation led Adam into the first sin and subsequently death passed upon all men. And the problem of sin is inseparable from the problem of our enemy. The devil or Satan, various names he's given in scripture, in scripture and various titles. If he is not defeated, the future of mankind seems to always be uncertain. You know, mankind was created perfect in the garden without sin. Original righteousness was in Adam, but there was an enemy present. And that enemy was Satan and he tempted Adam and Adam fell and the problem of our enemy is a great problem for mankind. If you, if you will, that I've heard it said this way, that the story of redemption is the story of a dragon that is oppressing the king's people. And the prince, the king's prince is sent to destroy the dragon. And once that dragon is destroyed, the peoples are free now. They have hope now. They can live at peace now. And there's a sense where that is the story of Scripture unfolding. There is a sense where that all of those stories that are, are spread across all ancient history. You know, dragons are an interesting story. I didn't mean for this at all to enter into this sermon. But they are in all sorts of stories of mankind throughout his, ancient history. Why do we have this theme of a dragon, of an enemy, of man? Throughout all of mankind, it's very unique, it's very strange. But Satan is the enemy of God's creation, he's the enemy of man, recorded in scripture. And the scriptures have good news for us. The gospel accounts have very good news because when, they, when the demons, when these evil spirits see Jesus, they always seem to cry out in terror. What have you to do with us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is not our time. <laughs> Be encouraged by that. 
your enemy are scared of him, our Lord. He did more than just scare demons, though. The Bible says, Jesus says of himself in Matthew 12, 28 through 29, he says this, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is to say, it is, and yes, it is. The kingdom of God has come upon you, and the spirit of God is in me, and I'm casting out demons, and God's power is in the world. I'm in the world. He says this, though. This is, this is what I want us to hear. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. We read it this morning. If you could hear it over the rumble of all of the motorcycles. One of the great promises of Christ's coming begins like this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. Now, I want us to think about that. And I always say this to you. You're probably sick of this analogy. But we're on the other side of the world from Israel right now. The gospel has come this far. It's gone further. And it's continuing to go into this world. I tell you often, I'm encouraged by what, what I hear about the gospel and how it has power still to save and is going through regions of this world that we don't often hear about because a lot of those regions are held in tyranny and if the word got out, those Christians would be killed and suppressed and oppressed and all of those things, but the word is going forth to this day into dark areas of this world and people are hearing the gospel and that's what I want you to hear this morning verse 5 says the things that were bloody in the boots of the warrior they're going to be used for fire there's going to be peace on the earth we should notice that there will be peace here where there was division even in this church I think that we could say that's true we see a, a melting pot in this church what do we come together for? What gives us peace together? It's not our upbringing. It's not our, probably even our political views. If we were to divide those out all together, I don't know how much peace we'd maintain even in this church. Darkness has been brought, turned to light though. But the scriptures say this with regards to darkness. The darkening or blinding work of Satan leads to perishing. Indeed, the Darkness is often due in this world to the work of Satan, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is glory of Christ, listen, who is the image of God. So the darkening or binding work, blinding work of Satan leads to perishing. We read in verse 3 of that same text, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. There's a sense of darkness there. There's a sense of dimness. There's a sense that without be, being able to see Christ, there is no salvation. There is perishing. There's that wrath we heard of earlier. And the question comes, did Jesus, when he spoke of, him, of the strong man binding, or when he spoke of binding the strong man so that he would plunder the strong man's house, did he speak of himself? Let me read that text again to you, Matthew 12, 29. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. I think this is how we should understand this. Jesus is speaking about he is there, the spirit of God is present upon him, which is no accident. And he says this, he gives this analogy. And here's how I think we should understand this. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first strong, binds the strong man? That strong man is Satan in this context. This is the demonic world led by Satan. 
His house is the realm of his influence, principalities, powers, etc. in this world. And his goods are the souls of men, those whom he's entrapped in darkness. And Jesus said, when the kingdom of heaven is among you, which in the context is where the spirit of God is. Not merely the son of man, that's true as well, but the spirit of God. Who did Jesus leave? The church. Who did he send the church? Who did he say the father will send him in my name and I will send him? The Holy Spirit. The spirit is still in this world. The Holy Spirit is still among his church. And as long as that is here, as long as he is here and he is with us and he is in us, the strong man can be bound. And we can plunder his house. We don't think of that. Sometimes Christians only think of ourselves in a defensive posture. <laughs> and that's wrong theology, I believe. You know, the defensive, or the, let me say this, the armament that we are given, we are described in e e Ephesians chapter 6, none of it is for the back. None of it. Even the term stand, therefore, in the evil day and having done all to stand, is one that says, hold your footing. Do not move backwards. Even the analogy that the gates of hell will not pre prevail against the church. The gates are a defensive structure. And we look around us and we think, oh, we are just failing. The church of God is under attack, and it is. But should that surprise us? Should we start moving backwards? Should we recede into the territory of defeat? I do not think so. God forbid that we do. If we take what Christ has taught us, then we should expect a war. <laughs> we should expect people to hate us. We should expect people not to like us at our work. And we should love them in response. Instead of being so distraught at what we are losing in this nation, and I'm distraught by it politically, the influence of the church is waning tremendously. We're seeing a law now called the Respect for Marriage Act, which has no respect for marriage. What it's defending is not marriage, and that should concern us. But that is not the ground for our confidence, I want you to hear this morning. Did Christ come and defeat Satan? That's what I want to ask you right now. Did he bind the devil at his first coming? Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. This has Advent, Epiphany all over it. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death, that's not how you win. <laughs> you don't win by humbling yourself and dying unless you're Jesus. That's right, Paige. <laughs> you don't win that way unless you're the son of God. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. We were talking about that last week. This text struck me in the, in the week. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. What is it to face a world without the fear of death? You know, a few years ago, and I'm, I don't know if you're ever out of it when you go through, uh, you know, a, a, a problem. And I talked about this too much to you, but uh, a few years ago when I was facing a, a certain crisis mentally and emotionally in my life, it is at the point of death that I think there was a certain victory that was won. If the worst thing that can happen to me is this trial that I'm going through leads to my death, Christ has won. Christ has won. 
Christ has defeated my failures, my inabilities, my sins, my enemy who would hold me accountable for my sin before God. He has to flee before God because of what Christ did. If the worst thing that befalls us in this world happens, Christ's appearance says it is not enough to separate us from the love of God. And that goes for our enemy, too. I see a lot of Christians, and they're running around, and they are just consumed with Satan this. Satan this, and Satan that, and Satan this, and Satan that. And he's out there. And we need not to be arrogant in ourselves, but we need to be boastful in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what this says. It was through death that Jesus destroyed the one who has the power of death. Not will, but did. He did it. And who'd he do it for? All those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He says here he did it for the children. He did it for those he came to save, those who would believe on his name. That's encouraging, I hope, to you. Paul says it like this in Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Christ has delivered us from the domain of darkness and trans... God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. What domain of darkness? Who, who rules in that domain? Satan would be the ruler in that domain. But we're not in his domain anymore. In whom we have redemption, that is through Christ, the forgiveness of sins. The fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 2 is described for us in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I want to read these verses because we don't always read these verses in relationship to Satan's enmity against sinners. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Listen, following the prince of the power of the air. You were under his dominion, another word. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Satan had dominion over us in our natural state. That's what that says. And we followed him. We did his will. We are under his authority. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we are dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. And that means along with saved from the condemnation of God, saved from the dominion of Satan. I hope you are encouraged by that truth. This is a transformation that should give all of us hope we actually live in a better estate than the first Adam, if this is true. Satan still is our enemy. He still will tempt us. He still will try to trip us up. He still will try to steer us away from the goodness of God that is found here in the body, that's found in doing righteousness, it's found in loving God, loving our neighbor. He will try to do anything he can to rip us from the joy that Christ died for us to have. But he doesn't do it with authority anymore. He doesn't have dominion over you if you are in Christ Jesus. Christ came for that end. He accomplished that end. Some of you, you're struggling with sin and you're saying, well, Satan seems very much alive and well. But I want us to see this distinction. He, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, give no opportunity to the devil. That, this is the way we should think about that. Satan is on the outside now. We're, we're not marching along with his army. We're not marching to his beat. We're not doing his will. He's on the outside. He's got his arrows. He's slinging them. He's trying to harm us. And so we are from that position to give him no opportunity. You see, it's a position of grace we're in. It's a position of deliverance we're in. 
That's where we put on the armor and face him as an enemy, not as our ruler. That's a good position to be in, beloved. But some of you are struggling with sin and you're saying this is persistent and it's continuing, it's continuing and I want you to hear this because this continues with our next point. 1 John 3, 5 through 6, you could turn to 1 John if you want. I just want to read this to you because it relates to both the second and third point. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And so the third point that I have this morning is Jesus appeared to remove sin's dominion over us. We see Satan's dominion removed, but now we see sin's dominion removed. And they're connected. That's what I want us to see. But we need to see that both are at stake here in Christ's appearing. Satan just doesn't want to keep people in darkness. He wants sin to conquer man created in God's image and indeed God's creation. He is against God and against God's good purposes. Jesus did not merely appear to save us from sin's condemnation or our enemy, but also sin's power itself. That is its prevailing influence in our life. John is concerned in his first epistle to correct some of the prevailing ideas that had already crept in among the church. One of the central purposes for his first epistle is that early on in the church, people were saying that you can have faith in Jesus and have Jesus as your savior and yet bear no fruit of change in your life. Have no righteousness at all as an evidence that you are in Christ. And he's saying this is not the case. That's one of his main arguments. Another argument is an argument that said Jesus didn't come in the flesh. That only he was spirit and he, he just appeared as being a man. But he actually wasn't truly a man. Because very early in the church they recognized the deity of Christ. But there is a philosophy that believed that anything physical was inherently evil. So how could Jesus truly be a man and the deity at the same time? They, they, so they rejected the humanity of Jesus, and that's another purpose why John writes. And you can't reject the humanity of Jesus and be a Christian. Neither can you reject his deity and be a Christian. But for our purposes, it's the, it's the matter of righteous living that I want us to see. Jesus came so that we would not be in bondage to sin any longer. Does your sin, does your remaining sin concern you? Does it grieve you? John says in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. That is, they don't know him <laughs> savingly. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked, that is, Christ walked. Verses 9 and 10. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now. At this point, someone might think, well, to truly be convinced that I'm a Christian, I have to be perfect. <laughs> and I want us to understand something of the language John is using. 
When he's talking about sinning, he's talking about a continual uh, following of sin, a continual practice in it, a continual and unrepented state of existence where you pursue in the trajectory of your life is towards sin. And the reason why I know that is because if you go back to chapter 1, he says, if anyone says he has no sin, he is a liar. <laughs> He's, he says flat out. And then in chapter 2, he begins and he says, Jesus, hit the end of our salvation is that when he appears, we'll be like him. But we're not like him yet. And what he means by that is in perfect righteousness. We will be like him when we see him. We will be like him at his second appearance. But we're not there yet. But he uses these verbs describing sinning as an ongoing process. I like to think of it as a trajectory. And I've told this to you before. The trajectory of the Christian life is towards righteousness. But that is not always smooth. It's not always a straight path, is it? Paul says it's very slow, in fact. To me, it's like a little babbling brook. I've said this analogy before. It's like a babbling brook goes down, if you've ever seen them, and they sort of go around these areas that, that it seems like they're almost standing still, but they're still going down. They're still going down, but they are going down. Sin does not remain the dominant feature in the life of a believer in Christ. Why? Why, I want to ask. Why is he arguing this way? Well, in our text that Brother Jim read, and we're just going to look at very briefly, beginning in verse 5, I just want to read verse 5 through 10 again. You know that he appeared. Here it is. This is a purpose statement. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. Now, that has two aspects, I believe. The same thing that Hebrews meant, take away, remove it from God's sight. We're not condemned any longer. To take away sins in that sense. But also, in the context, there's more than that. And in him, there is no sin. That's Jesus. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So this is the relationship. He came to take away sin. When we are in him, that sin is removed. It's taken away indeed. But if we abide in him, we don't continue sinning. It doesn't have the same authority over us that it did. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Listen to that. Two statements. The reason why the Son of Man appeared was to take away sins. Now, the reason why the Son of Man appeared is to destroy the works of the devil. What do those look like? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abide in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. So the very clear directive here is if your pattern of life is that you sin, you continue in it, you love it, you pursue it, you are of the devil. If your pattern of life is that Christ is in you, you are in him by faith, and you are being changed from glory to glory, your trajectory is repentance, faith, doing righteousness before God, Paul calls it Galatians 5, 5, 6, I believe. Faith works through love. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, on, ongoing. If these are the patterns, if that is the trajectory of your life, listen to this. Christ appeared so that it would be so. He appeared to make this happen. You know, there is an insidious awful doctrine that many Christians hold in the world today. And that is a person can have Christ and bear no fruit at all and still be assured that they have heaven. John is saying that is a lie. Amen. 
You think that you have the Son of God, the Spirit of God within you, and you can continue pursuing sin without brokenness? That God would allow that? And yet further and deeper is that God's purpose in Christ's coming, Jesus' purpose in coming, was that you don't remain under the dominion and influence of sin. If you're a Christian, that should be one of the great joys of your faith. It is of mine. Do you want to continue sinning before your God, your Father in heaven, against your Savior, who died, who humbled himself and died for you? who took upon you your sins, and you just think it flippant that you just continue in them? I hate to even imagine that somebody believed that. This should be a doctrine of joy for the church. You know, Paul, when he's wrestling with the remaining influence of his sin, he cries out, How do I get victory from this? The law just leads me further into despair. What is his exuberance? What is his statement of faith? What is his profession? What is his hope? Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The hope of our ongoing struggle against sin is that we are not our own, but we have been bought with a price. We have a new master. <laughs> it's not Satan anymore. We are servants, slaves, doulos, Romans chapter 6, of righteousness when we are in Christ. And every Christian says, so be it. Bind me more to righteousness, more to Christ, more in line with the purpose of his coming so that we'll be lights in this world and men will see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Or that men will see our good works and they will hate us because they hated Jesus. <laughs> and we will say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. When men call us evildoers, as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah called Lot an evildoer for telling them, don't do this evil thing, and God takes us out of that place, removes us to save us, we say, thanks be to God that he will remove us. Jesus appeared for these purposes. And finally, and very briefly, I know it's been a while, I want you to hear this. Jesus appeared forth to reverse the curse of sin. Colossians 1.19, we could also go to Ephesians 1. We should also go to Romans 8, but for brevity, I just want to read this. For in him, the incarnate Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, listen to this, to reconcile to himself all things. Paul doesn't leave us to question what they are. He really means everything. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Christ became incarnate to set right what Adam failed to do in the garden, and which not only corrupted man, but corrupted all of God's creation. Christ came to reverse the curse. To make all things new. He did that by the blood of his cross. Again, see how sin has invaded this world. God's creation mankind, misery, condemnation, subjugation to the devil, subjugation to a curse, 
Beloved, Christ came to do away with all of these things and he accomplished it. Rejoice, <laughs> rejoice, Emmanuel has come. He has come. This is that season where we remember through all of these things we go through and we go through them that there is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith in Christ, because he did it. I just want to end with this application very briefly. You know, this is a season that we can get caught up in a whole host of sins, envy, greed, covetousness, lust. We can get caught up with so many assortments of reasons for despair and for concern. Let's make this a season of worship within the body of Christ, within your own time alone with God, within your own struggles against sin, within your own discouragements. Find your encouragement in this Savior, in this Lord who appeared for these ends and rest there. Find peace there for your souls. Find hope there. Find encouragement and find joy. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you.